Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Dr. Mark Gomez, but you can call me Dr. G, and welcome to Health 360 with Dr. G. Today's topic, get pumped. What's new in heart tech? When it comes to new technologies, the field of cardiology has always seemed to position itself at the forefront of medical innovation. And why not? Heart disease has remained the number one cause of death worldwide for decades. Fittingly, it's no surprise that the biggest technology companies in the world continue to invest billions of dollars into the research and development of what may be some of the most influential game changers that the healthcare industry has ever seen. If we are truly an outcomes-based society, then in the end, it may all be worth it. Today in Health360 with Dr. G, it's time to get pumped and find out what's new in heart tech. Again, my name is Dr. Mark Gomez. Dr. G, board certified internal medicine physician, practicing out of Edward Hospital in Naperville, Illinois. I'm also a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Follow me across all the socials at health360wdrg and check me out on my website at health360podcast.com. We have an awesome show for you today. And before you meet my guest, let me hit you with a quick disclaimer. The content of Health360 with Dr. G, a healthy driven podcast, is for your information and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. So let's get after it, y'all. I want to introduce my guest today, special guest. Uh, he and I have known each other for a long time. He's seen so many of my patients, taking care of everything. I've been to several of his conferences, and his, and his, and his cardiology group has produced some really great content out there for physicians alike, like myself in primary care and other people that are just avid and just want to learn more about cardiology. And as I said in the beginning, cardiology has been on the forefront of innovation for forever. So again, fittingly, we've got this show today. So let me introduce you to my special guest today. Dr. Koshik Krishnan. And Dr. Krishnan is a double board certified cardiologist and cardiac electrophysiologist. He's with Midwest Cardiovascular Institute. Doc, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Happy to be hey, here. So, hey, so Doc, every comic book hero has an origin story. Go ahead and give us your story. How about we do this? Where did you grow up? Uh, and then uh, medical school, residency, fellowship, and why you do what you do each day. Uh, sounds good. So I grew up in uh, Arlington, Texas, uh, one of the suburbs between Dallas and Fort Worth. And I got my undergraduate degree in electrical and biomedical engineering, which somewhat relevant to my future career, even though I didn't really know that's where I would end up when I was an undergrad. Um, so I went to college at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. I went to medical school at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School, which is also in Dallas. I moved to St. Louis and did my internal medicine residency at Washington University in St. Louis, my cardiology fellowship at Emory University in Atlanta, and back to Washington University for my cardiac electrophysiology fellowship. And then I've been in practice uh, since then in the Chicagoland area. And Doc, why is this topic about cardiac innovation technology, why is it so important to you and what you do each and every day? Well, I think the field that I chose drew me in because of some of the tech as well. Like I felt like it was a nice blend of being able to kind of have longitudinal relationships with patients and, and families over their lifetime, but also that the technology boom with computers, computing power would really impact our field, both from a diagnosis perspective a uh, treatment perspective, and hopefully with the tech that we're going to be talking about, really from a preventative standpoint as well, predicting disease and being able to intervene before patients need the therapies that we currently offer them as therapeutic or diagnostic tools. Wonderful. Well, there you have it, everybody. You met Dr. Christian. And so here's how the show works. I ask the questions. Doc's going to get some awesome answers. I'll participate where I can. Usually some of the easy stuff. And no, I'm just joking. Mm -hmm. But seriously, I want you to take that, grab that pen and paper, write something down. We all want you to be the best versions of yourself. And if you have questions, you know, start with your primary care physician. If your primary care physician doesn't know the answer or, or you need more resources, he or she can direct you to a cardiologist. I remember an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So doc, when people come into our office, we call it the chief complaint. So here it is, the chief complaint, aka the situation and question of the hour is this. What is the latest in cardiac tech and what promise 
does it hold for the future? So, Doc, let me set up the situation for you. So here we go. Before we can talk about both the present and future of cardiac tech, it is important to acknowledge what was done in the past. So generally speaking, what do you think were some of the biggest cardiology tech accomplishments of the 20th century? Oh, there's, uh, I, I can narrow it down to a few. There's probably going to be at least 100 that I won't uh, think of or even <laughs> mention. But I think that uh, what has really occurred over the 20th century and 21st century is being able to take what those master clinicians would do with physical exam and with the tools that they had at, at their disposal, such as a stethoscope, and be able to say, well, how can we get more information from our patients to be able to really understand things and maybe prevent disease and treat disease? So I think our diagnostic tools would be first and foremost in what I, what I would say has really allowed cardiology to see more and be able to intervene earlier, such as cardiac echocardiography. I think that is one of the most groundbreaking technologies, the ability to see inside of the body and see the heart moving and the valves working or not working without opening the chest, without just having to listen to the sounds and try to determine if the valve is leaking or, or narrow. Uh, secondly, our ability to do invasive procedures like angiography, when uh, we can now in a very short procedure, be able to detect whether someone has artery blockage and even fix those. The stories behind those technologies are really amazing of how uh, someone thought of the idea of inserting catheters into the heart and utilizing x-rays or uh, contrast agents to be able to visualize things that you would never would have been able to visualize without surgical surgical treatment. From a treatment perspective, I think pacemakers, you know, something near and dear to my heart is very, uh, very high on that list. Uh, you know, the very first pacemakers were machines that would, you'd literally have to carry around like a washing machine and they, you couldn't go home with them. And now there are procedures that can be done within an hour and you go home the same day and, and have battery lives of about 10 to 15 years, allow people with slow heart rates to live normal lives people with very dangerous fast heart rhythms to live normal lives and not be worried that they may suffer a cardiac arrest that could lead them to die. So I think the diagnostic tools, the, you know, the therapeutic um, and, you know, electronic things like pacemakers are come to mind as uh, three or four of the top ones. Wonderful. And so doc, you know, that healthcare is continuing to massively shift at the hands of technology and the cycle of innovation for technology is exponential. You know, when I think about it, uh, you know, I, I say, you know, there are major aspects to change and technology is truly shifting. As a matter of fact, this means when we talk about exponential growth in technology, uh, a lot of a lot of experts will say that the field is massively shifting by the year 2040, but still we got some time for that. Uh, but we can put on our future hats and say we're going to have just so much technology at our fingertips. But right now, we know that healthcare is institutionally focused. So here's a question. How does healthcare go from an institutionally focused approach to a more personalized one, in your opinion? Yeah, I think that's actually very much where it is going. And to some extent, I think COVID may have actually helped move those technologies forward because some of those same personalized technologies are things that allow us to be able to monitor patients from home. So some examples would be digital blood pressure cuffs that could allow us to get data on a more real-time basis. Apple watches, Cardio Mobile, which are ways for us to get EKG data and information from patients from home. Uh, implantable monitors that can monitor heart failure uh, symptoms. So I think that those are some examples in the heart field of like electrical, blood pressure, heart failure monitoring that allow us to say, how do we keep patients healthy? How do we keep them out of the hospital? And the information that we've learned is that sometimes by the time patients come to the emergency room or uh, have enough symptoms to present to you or I, they're already further down the road to where they almost always will need 
a hospitalization to reverse the the condition that they have. Whereas with these technologies, if we can catch things at the earliest stage, you can intervene quicker and keep people out of the hospital. And that will help, you know, from a societal standpoint, it decreases hospitalizations, it de decreases healthcare utilization, allows those resources to be utilized in other, other more, uh, maybe more, you know, beneficial ways for society. I got you. And I always say that, you know, it's like, a, you know, technology will improve well-being and literally putting the tools in the hands of the consumer uh, has been amazing. And consumers can take their health care into their own hands quite literally. We're talking about some of the devices that are out mm -hmm. there that hopefully provide, continue to provide data real time, as you said, and information that can benefit truly a truly customizable wellness plan. So let's get into some of the hottest trends in tech and some of the things that I think of that are going on right now. And there's a lot to read about when I was preparing for this, preparing to talk with you, Doc, there's like just like a, a cornucopia of, of cool tools, gadgets uh, that are out there that are being used right now or things that are on the horizon being developed and tested. And as I said in my opening um, comments, that Innovation has been the forefront of cardiology. It's what you guys do. Uh, and it's just going to be so excited. I, and this is me, me just geeking out and getting excited about things that that what, what you and, and your colleagues are doing to innovate the field um, is only going to benefit society. Of course, we want to have equity and we want it to benefit and reach as many people as possible. Um, but but we know that those are some those are some real challenges. But but again, I, I feel like we're gonna have some really good um things out there that that people will not be able to fail at. It's like almost like it's like it's almost like it's impossible to fail. So here we go. So what I'll do in this section here is I'm gonna state the technology doc, and then I'll have you kind of you know give us a kind of example of how it may be currently used now or how it could be used maybe in the future. And additionally, think about this. How close are we to the technology? Is it real right now? Is it maybe on the horizon? Um, what's its potential to create sustainable impact? And then lastly, how accessible is it to the masses? So let's start with this one. Artificial intelligence. Everybody's talking about AI. Uh, Dr. Krishna, what do you think about AI in cardiology right now? Where's it going? What, where's it now? And where's it going? Right now, I think it's in its infancy, but I really think this is one of those foundational technologies that we will think of like the light bulb, like electricity. We, when Edison developed the light bulb, he used electricity, but probably, I mean, I'm certain, would never have imagined all the applications of electricity hundreds of years later. Um, I think AI is going to be like that. We don't even understand all the things that it can possibly and potentially do. It's a little bit scary. Maybe there are things that we don't understand about it that might scare us, but I, I do think that there are so many applications that you can think of with the ability to collect so much data that we have, and whether it's in electronic medical records, whether it's on your wrist and mm -hmm. seeing, you know, when you go to sleep with your Apple Watch and you wake up and it tells you all these things about your sleep and your oxygen levels and your heart rates you didn't even know was going on. Imagine if that information was now aggregated and, and you amongst yourself, like day to day, week to week, month to month, just using yourself as your own internal control. And what about as a society, if, if we could pick up trends and say, well, if we program these watches to be able to pick up these subtle changes that you and I might not even know are happening, uh, maybe it would prevent disease, maybe it would pre you know, predict that someone's going to go and have a heart attack or someone's going to have atrial fibrillation. These are things that we may not even be able to pick up because they're only a computer with a lot of computing power with a lot of data can even see those small trends. Uh, whereas we as humans can see things that change in large amounts, but those tiny changes aren't things that are well suited for the human eye or for the human brain, but might be very well suited for a, a computer. So I think that right now, the where artificial intelligence is, is probably most used is taking information from electronic medical records, from EKGs, and trying to predict future disease from subtle changes in their in, in someone today, because they've they crunched through the data and they can say, well, anybody with this disease, if you look back 10 years ago and look at their EKG or their echo, 
they had these changes. You just didn't know 10 years ago that it was going to lead to that disease 10 years later. But because you have access to hundreds of thousands of patients now, you can now go backwards in time and find correlations between things that you may not have known to look. Like how many of us in cardiology say, well, let me go back and look at the EKG of this 80-year-old mm -hmm. back when they were 30 years old. And do we see something in that, third, in that EKG from age 30 that might have predicted their disease at age 80? And that's one of the powers of AI is being able to look backward and forward, be able to correlate and see things that we may not be able to see. I think it's just fascinating on things and kind of where my brain goes. I'm like thinking about, you know, you know, a common example, many people go for a CT heart scan protocol. So if there's any evidence that would suggest early coronary artery disease and you can get a result back in literally five minutes, preliminary result. I mean, I mean, you know, using technology to say, Hey, we're in the clear, you know, we're probably in the clear, but Hey, we're not. And I like how you said, you can go back and look for those nuances that maybe you or I wouldn't have picked up. There's an interesting uh, uh, um, theme. It's, it's called digital. I only started reading about it, but called uh, digital twinning. And that's about bringing together as much data as possible and simulating a possible outcome of therapy or treatments. And it's almost like in nature, um, there's physiology in how we work and there's physiology in nature. And just like how the weatherman can predict the weather or, or astrophysicists can predict how stars are going to align and how things in the universe work, taking natural physiology plus mathematical laws, plus advanced computing data set and just see what happens and do all that supercomputing and get something that can literally be a game changer. And so it's just, it's just so awesome. Let me ask you this question, doc, are you hearing anything about art, like AI giving automatic, like um, oh, you mentioned echocardiogram earlier as, as a, as a big innovation in, in the 20th century, but are you hearing anything about um, automatic, like AI calculated ejection fractions on how efficient the heart might be or, or capturing optimal views of an image of a heart before you as a doc even get a chance to review them yourself? Yeah, I've heard not only for echoes, for almost any of our imaging, there's a movement towards, can a computer read this data quicker and more efficiently than a human can. And I'm certain, I'm certain that will create a lot of controversy that the experience of someone who reads, you know, the, these echoes, thousands of them a year over a decades of their, of their life, that they're going to see things and uh, that a computer might not. But uh, I do think there is some power in the ability for computers to at least give you a baseline read. I mean, we already see that even in EKGs. I mean, we don't, we didn't call it AI. Uh, years ago, but almost all of our EKGs in the, you know, for the probably the last five to 10 years of my career, when we get EKGs, the computer will give you kind of a baseline read. And we're not there yet, because I know having read these EKGs <laughs> that you do have to <laughs> modify them a fair amount. Yeah. So that doesn't mean that it won't one day be better. But clearly, that form of artificial intelligence has already existed for over a decade and keeps getting better. And when you actually think about it and say, you know, 30, 25 years ago, when an EKG stack would show up, I would have to physically write in all those diagnoses. And now the computer picks things, these things up. And then I look at it and I'm like, yeah, that's actually pretty good. It picked that up. And, <laughs> and then there's times where it doesn't pick things up. But I, I do think that the fact that a computer is rational in the sense that uh, it it's without emotion, it's going to just look at things very factual, factually. It may not be able to put two and two together sometimes, but that's what AI is going to hope, hopefully bring is it, these computers aren't just giving factual information, they can contextualize information. They can say, well, I saw that the original indication for this echo is shortness of breath. And it takes that piece of information and it knows in the electronic med medical record, this person's BNP was 15,000 or their creatinine was 1.8. And it can take all that pieces of information just like we would as a, as a human and say, reading this echo in isolation isn't as powerful as putting it in the context of the individual that you're reading it 
for or the person that that you did the echo on. Wow, that's so awesome. Again, so much awesome stuff with AI. Love it. Let's see this next topic here. Um, transcatheter mitral and tricuspid valve intervention. And I'll start out with this. I'll just give a background story to our listeners. So in 2019, the FDA cleared the use of transcatheter aortic valve replacement, something called TAVR, for all patient surgical risk categories. And so, the, which was the final step of opening this procedure to basically all comers and essentially making it the new standard of care. So TAVR is a minimally invasive procedure in which a new valve is inserted uh, without removing the old damaged valve. So the new valve is placed inside the disease valve and somewhat like placing a stent in an artery, the TAVR approach delivers a fully collapsible replacement valve to the valve site through a catheter. And then once the new valve is expanded, it pushes the old valve aside, the leaflets out of the way, and then the tissue and the replacement valve takes over the job of allowing and regulating blood flow. So they say, Doc, that TAVRs may account for, by the year 2025, 75% of all aortic valve cases uh, being uh, TAVR. But, you know, your, your field of cardiology, you and your colleagues in cardiology, you get one thing going on and you might say, okay, what's the next thing I could do with this? So um, are you and your colleagues doing things with now mitral valves and, and tricuspid valves and with a similar type of approach? Yes. Um, and it will be applied to those valves as well. Like the, the con- conceptually it exists, like there are transcatheter mitral valves, there's transcatheter tricuspid valves. The difficulty with those valves compared to the aortic valve is more of an issue of the anatomy and the geometry of those valves. You know, the, the aortic valve sits in a very tubular structure. So it's a little easier and more well-suited to replacement with a percutaneous valve versus the the structure of a mitral valve and a tricuspid valve are much are larger they're not necessarily tubular they have valvular apparati that that keep them attached to the left ventricle or the right ventricle so these are things right now that make it challenging to develop the technology and that's why it has not developed as quickly as the taver or pulmonic valve replacements, but it's only a matter of time. There's already at least a dozen companies that have come up with their own versions of how to deliver valves for the mitral valve and the tricuspid, because the next big one is the mitral valve. The mitral valve is another valve that fails frequently, uh, not as often narrowing like the aortic valve. It's more leaking and regurgitating is the term that we use. And same with the tricuspid valve, but these are valves that most likely in our lifetimes are going to have a percutaneous option as well. And it's more just figuring out the physics and the engineering of how to get a valve that's shaped to fit in that area properly. And once that obstacle is overcome, it will have a similar kind of uh, future as tavern. Wow, that's awesome. Let's see this next one here. Everybody's doing it. Wearable technologies to aid patient monitoring. Here's how I'll, I'll give you the background. So basically, we know nearly everyone now carries a smartphone. Seriously, nearly everyone carries a mm-hmm. smartphone. Although I do have, a, have an amazing patient who uh, who's in her early 80s and her kids have asked her to get a smartphone. They offered to pay for, pay, pay for her. Uh, and she's like, I'm not going to do it. Uh, but, but anyways, we know nearly everybody carries a smartphone and millions of people are using wearable devices to track their health using an Apple Watch or Fitbit or Garmin or any of the major players out there. So it's not surprising that these devices can be leveraged for their interoperability, smartphone and smartphone-based apps to healthcare professionals and consumers alike. So let me ask you this question. Where are we at with wearables? Where are we at? Where, where's this going? Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, um, uh, a live course, a cardio device. You know, where is this going now, wearables? You know, I think it's very important what you mentioned about the cell phone linking, because in most countries, like the grandkids and grandparents have communicated and like with with cell phones to where people that maybe were a little scared of technology had to become more familiar with technology to be able to communicate. And I know you've had one of my partners, Dr. Salim, on your talk, on your foot. We've gone on these medical mission trips. And what you realize is that everyone has a cell phone, even in refugee camps in Lebanon, 
people have cell phones. So leveraging a cell phone as a, as a key component to technology is going to be really accessible to many, many people around the world. But right now, probably the most common technology that I think most people have or have some form of is the watch. The wearable watch that now has sensors built into it. There's optical sensors in the back that can monitor your blood flow, your oxygen levels. They can measure your heart rate. They can even record an EKG. Uh, I'm sure they're, they're going to, at some point, be able to diagnose sleep apnea. They, we have you know glucose sensors. There, there may be a way eventually for these phones without having to wear one of those glucose sensors to be able to look at blood flow in your hand or your wrist and be able to monitor. So I, I think we're just, we are at the tip of the iceberg on wow. what we, what we can actually record from. And I think you understand that these high tech companies like Apple, Samsung, they recognize that there is a huge untapped market for using their consumer products as healthcare devices, not just for, you know, right now it would be primarily for diagnosing. And I, I mean, my mind can go into many different areas of where I think these watches could potentially go. They could me measure your blood pressure. They could measure glucose, your oxygen levels, heart rate, uh, O2 saturations. They can measure your sleep cycle, REM cycles. They could, for all, uh, I mean, who knows? They can maybe even be able to determine how much you're going to sweat and what your electrolytes are. And so I think we're at the really at the tip of what what these can do. And I'm sure there are people, very smart engineers at Apple, Google, Samsung that are thinking 10 steps ahead of me right now on what, what they can do with this. Hey, Doc, this is just fascinating stuff. Again, it's here to stay. And, uh, you know, I think about for my end, it's like just the communication aspect. You know, will it will it in the future? Well, well certainly with the intraoper, um, let's start going back to uh, University of Connecticut um, was one of the first institutions to put these um, um miniaturized devices in for their heart failure patients as part of the uh, uh, Jim Calhoun um, cardiac center. And, uh, and literally these little sensors can, can really monitor if you may be at risk for having an exacerbation uh, uh, by measuring the pressure changes uh, in the pulmonary arteries. And so I was like, whoa, through a simple procedure, now you can actually hopefully get somebody pre-hospitalization intervene, maybe add medicines, call them up, and there and that data is being monitored 24-7, 365 by a team. You know, I mean, is this where is this where it's all I mean the possibilities seem endless with uh wearable type devices. Yeah, those kind of things are already in existence. Like those pulmonary artery sensors allow us, like we had talked a few minutes ago about how do we catch something before it reaches the point where a patient will be so symptomatic that they need to be hospitalized. And this pulmonary artery sensor has a name called CardioMEMS. It is, uh, allows us to be able to monitor. And even in our pacemakers and defibrillators, this technology, uh, like some brilliant engineers came up with the idea that we have leads inside the heart and a device that sits on the in the chest right below the skin. Well, what sits between the heart and your skin is the lungs. And the lungs, when they're full of air, they have a certain resistance to electricity. And just like you're not supposed to touch water and touch electricity or your hair dryer at the same time, because it's a very good conductor of electricity, if your lungs start filling up with fluid, that resistance to electrical flow changes. And they recognize that they can now catch heart failure early through pacemakers and defibrillators, just like they could with those implantable sensors. So some people already have devices that are doing this. We have thousands of patients in our pacemaker and defibrillator clinics that monthly we get this data and we can, we can see how active they are. We can see yeah. their mobility. We can see their, the resistance and impedance, but I want to go back one step to when you're talking about Please. wearable technology, this, this is, um, you know, one of my former roles before coming to Edward, I, I did a lot of work with some of the professional teams in, uh, oh, yeah. in Chicago. Those athletes now are so attuned to tech to help them with their, you know, physical athletic performance, sleep, wearing sensors, like monitoring heart rate variability. 
they will they will tailor their exercise one day to the next based on their heart rates, their oxygen levels, because maybe they didn't get a good night's sleep or they had a really hard workout the day before. Things that you may not even know. It's like, I just don't feel right, but you can see that heart rate variability overnight. They wear shirts with heart rate sensors. And mm -hmm. and uh, so it's trickling down to even people that aren't really at super high risk for cardiovascular disease, but just to optimize life, optimize mm -hmm. their their uh, athletic performance. And again, the artificial intelligence of knowing it's like, okay, well, when we see athletes where their resting pulse is 10% higher than it was before, we know that their performance the next day at an athletic performance drops down. And it's okay, well, why do you think it happened? Well, maybe when, maybe they're dehydrated, maybe they right. had a hard workout, a hard game, and they need a day off, or they need to have a lighter workout that day so that the next game will be at an optimal performance. And that kind of technology is going to be available to all of us, not just to professional athletes. Gotcha. That is so, that, hey, this is just, it's just so fun. And then of course, and and, and I think probably when, when people come in and see you with their tech, or even then coming to see me if they do tech, I'm like, I want to know because there's new stuff out there all the time, but I want, I, I like the, the practical thing. And then how can I, like I said, with the athletes, it can modify their approach. It can allow them to recover and hopefully optimize their performance. And who doesn't want day in, day out, everyday folk like me and you, who doesn't want to have optimal performance? So using this information in a good way. And, uh, and then also on the flip side, can you get somebody in as a, you know, we think about like cardiac patients, but can you get them in the pre-cardiac patient status, uh, because something might tell you that something's off and then it triggers you to go see your doc who may then do X, Y, Z testing and then gets over to you. So you catch them in that pre-state, which I think is right. phenomenal that we can make an intervention if that's our, again, again outcomes based. So let me actually switch things a bit. Let's talk a little VR, virtual reality, augmented reality, VR and AR. So in cardiology, uh, uh, I, I certainly believe, and I've read some some great papers that are out there, but using augmented reality and virtual reality are now being used by large cardiology device vendors for staff training. I know there's several companies out there, but Doc, take us through it. Where do you see you know AR being used right now? Um, is it being used in a pre-planning type approach? Um, um, catheterization, you know, EP lab, what you guys do, um, uh, angiograms for the individual cardiologists, where are we seeing this is going, uh, AR and VR? So I think uh, I, I already see it in a couple of areas in our field. One for sure, as you mentioned, is like education. The It's, it's really well primed for education, like both augmented reality using, uh, you know, those Oculus uh, head, headsets and for, to be able to teach remotely new techniques and new technologies. In our field, there are new techniques of implanting devices that maybe would be very difficult for you to learn without physically watching someone do it. And that may not be very easy for busy people to find time to go fly somewhere and find someone that will be doing that procedure. And then you're kind of peering over them to kind of see what they're doing. Most of these companies have now either video those procedures with, with technology that allows you to feel like you're doing the procedure yourself or seeing it in with your own eyes, like right in front of you rather than watching someone else do it. So it's already present in education. It's also present in pre-procedure planning. There's many types of our procedures that we now have data from CT scans or echocardiography, transesophageal echoes, and that data, we can look at it like a radiologist would look at it. But what we really want to be able to do is say, well, when we implant this device, how is it going to look in this patient's body without having to implant it first? And we are using this at Edward almost on a monthly basis. We implant these left atrial appendage occlusion devices, both the Watchman and Amulet. And we've partnered with companies in uh, overseas that allow us to do virtual implants. Like we can take a CT scan from a patient of ours, sec, you know, create a 3D reconstruction of it. Mm -hmm. And that we can do, we've always, we've been able to do that for many years. The new twist to that is saying, well, what size device is gonna fit in that appendage properly? 
Is it going to be a 25 millimeter device or 30 millimeter device? And if we put that in, how is it going to look? Do we put it in deep? Do we put it back proximal? How much compression? So we can actually predict which device we're going to use before we even get into the procedure. And we're actually collecting data on that right now to see how well these technologies are to reality. And I don't have the final data set, but it seems quite uh, predictive. Like when we use this technology, we're much less likely to have to try multiple devices to get the right one to fit. Like the first one, based on what we predicted with the technology, allows us to choose the right size device the first time, which means the procedure goes smoother, less risk to the patient, faster, easier recovery because the procedure was quicker. Wow, this is so awesome what you guys are doing. Let's talk a little bit about holograms. Oh, what are we seeing with holograms? Holograms being used for maybe as a segue or piggyback on what you just said. Holograms, uh, being able to have an image right on top of somebody's body, maybe while they're lying on the table, spinning it around. We kind of joked around like Minority mm -hmm. Report and yeah. some old sci-fi movies. Yeah. But but where are we at with that kind of technology? You know, a few years ago, I thought that was pie in the sky science fiction. And I just recently came back from my Heart Rhythm <laughs> Society meeting. It's all, it's yeah. already here. There are legit company, legitimate companies that have a tremendous amount of funding to do these kind of things for cardiology and probably for surgical specialties. Any, anything where you're looking at d data in, in on a 2D screen, but really it's a three-dimensional structure that you're that you're looking at. And our field has a lot of this. Like we create these three-dimensional maps of the electrical system and the heart, but we're visualizing it on a screen. And we have to have someone rotate it for us and look, but we're still rotating it on a, in a 2D image. These companies have brought that image from the flat panel screen out in front of the screen, between me and the screen. And now I could, I could see the heart like it would look like if the heart was right in front of me, not as a picture on a screen. So it may be a little soon to know all the all <laughs> the applications, but I whether it's just a cool technology where I could be literally moving my hand and rotating an image of the heart and seeing my catheter from different angles, just or maybe even moving my eyes and being able to do that. Uh, without having to use my hands at all or, or with, with voice prompts, you know, rotate image, you know, forward, backward, superior, inferior. There's uh, this technology exists. And I think it's going to be a few years before it's commercially available, uh, but it's here. So, oh my gosh. So doc, you know, I want 3D stuff in my practice. You know, you guys get to have all the fun and have all the toys. That's all good. So, hey everybody, we're sitting here, uh, you know, I'm sitting down here with uh, Dr. Koshik uh, Christian, and we're talking about cardiac tech, what's doing there. You're watching us here on listening to us on Health360 with Dr. G, health360podcast.com. So I want to do one more of these things, um, you know, maybe maybe two, we'll see. I'm uh, just loving this talk about these different technologies, but let's do this one. Let's do virtual image-based uh, 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 FFR technologies. And so basically I'll lead it in like this. So uh, virtual-based technologies, again, can we make things using technology to do things here. So, so basically, um, FFR stands for fractional flow reserve, and it's an assessment that 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 basically compares the blood flow on either side of a blockage in a coronary artery. Specifically, a cardiologist would normally in, in, uh, take an instrument um, and measure blood pressure readings on both sides of a, of a blockage, and then calculate uh, your flow of flat, what's called again a fractional flow reserve. And so really it allows the cardiologist to know how severe or narrowed that artery may be. And there's a scoring and your score is the most important thing because if your score is below a certain value, then that individual certainly would need treatment. And then the cardiologist, him or herself, the individual cardiologist would typically either give you medication if you might be a little bit low or if you're if you know enough, they may do an angio, a procedure called an angioplasty and then put a stent in to open the artery. But that tech, you know, how that's been done, Doc, that takes time, uh, still using wire-based approaches, um, uh, fluoroscopy, x-rays, takes time, some radiation exposure. Now we're using um, CT scans, um, 
well, you know, to kind of do things. So where are we going with technology now that might be a way to intervene faster um, with looking at flow to see if somebody needs a stint or not? Yeah, this is a, has always been the holy grail of, of cardiac CT imaging is how do we get from the anatomy that we have to the physiology that matters to how we function as human beings. And that it's mind blowing the physics and the, and the technology that, you know, we're using, like we have partners in our group that are experts in CT. And now when you see a blockage on an angiogram, it's, it's a two dimensional image and you have to determine whether or not that is functionally creating problems for the patient. Now we can take those CT scans, analyze them offline and be able to determine and say this blockage needs to be fixed. And as you mentioned, it's, you know, we have many patients where we do the angiograms, like, oh, it's, it looks like it's only about a 50% blockage. We don't really need to fix it. But that's 50% because we're only looking at one or two angles. And if with these fractional flow, you're going to find that there are some people with those kind of blockages that functionally act like someone with more severe limitation of blood flow. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're symptomatic. And if you just went strictly based on an angiography based treatment paradigm, you might say, well, it doesn't meet the criteria to fix it. Or you might say, well, you're heading in the direction of needing a stent. This is a perfect time for us to intervene with high dose statins or lifestyle modifications, mm -hmm. uh, dietary changes. So uh, there are multiple companies now that have are able to do these kinds of technology, these kind of analyses without ever having to do an invasive procedure. And I think that as much as it, I'm sure that my colleagues that do interventional cardiology <laughs> and angiograms are like, say. Yep. <laughs> um, they'll still have their business to do the yeah. procedure to fix the problems, but they'll probably have to do less diagnostic angiograms because those will be able to figure out with CAT scans and with FFR analysis. Fascinating. Let's do one more thing and then we're going to get into some mis versus right. facts. Let's do leadless pacemaker technolo technology. Doc, uh, I, I attended one of your lectures last summer uh, in Oak Brook as your group put on, on some stuff and, and you and your colleagues talked a little bit. You had to tease the crowd of us primary care docs mm -hmm. about leadless uh, pacemaker technology. Uh, gives the skinny. Why is this better than, than, than the pacemakers of yesteryear? Um, just why, how is it improving what you guys are doing and helping patients at the end? So the Achilles heel of permanent pacemakers. I mean, I, I, I started off this whole hour <laughs> with how great pacemakers were as a, as a foundational technology, you know, paradigm right. shifter. But the Achilles heel for our pacemakers has been and will always be the leads. The pacemaker sits under the skin, but it has to communicate with the heart with wires that go into the vein and into the bloodstream. These wires have conductors of electricity, just like the wire that connects your, your radio to the, to the electrical outlet. It's got insulation that's usually made by you know, some kind of silicone or polyurethane, and then a conductor. This wire is sitting in 98.6 degree solution for decades. And this solution is also full of salt. You know, our sodium, we have sodium, we have potassium, we have magnesium. And then on top of that, it's your heart's beating, you know, 500,000 times a week. And it's, imagine taking any, any wire, put it in 98 degree bath with salt and just bend it a million times. Eventually it's going to break. And so these leads don't last forever. And when they fail, it creates problems. It creates problems because you have to try to remove them. They've grown into the walls and it can be a dangerous procedure to remove them. Secondly, these leads also are a risk for infection because anything that gets into your bloodstream is going to find a home on these leads and these and the insulation. When you look at them under the microscope, they're not smooth. They have little crevices and nooks and crannies and, they're, and those places are good places for bacteria to hide. So that we've known that the leads are the problem. The problem is how do we solve that? So leadless pacemakers are where the entire pacemaker system is contained in one unit, the battery, the ability to pace the heart. So it gets placed in the chamber of interest 
and is fixated into the muscle either with little grappling hooks, like the thing that Batman uses to uh, <laughs> scale a wall. It, he, you know, he throws that little rope up there. It's got the little hooks. It grabs onto something. Awesome. And then he, so these leadless pacemakers grab onto the tissue and they are self-contained. And the technology right now exists for pacing one chamber. And soon we're going to have technology to have two chambers wow. where they're not even connected to each other. Like each pacemaker one for the atrium, one for the ventricle. Right now, those wires go back to the pacemaker where the brains are, and it can take information from both leads and know what's going on in two chambers. Now we will have two leadless pacemakers, one that physically sits in the atrium, one that physically sits in the ventricle. Neither one of them are physically connected to each other, but electronically can communicate with each other, just like your Bluetooth headset can communicate with your, with your phone without physically touching each other, each chamber will know what the other chamber is doing. So this will allow us to avoid the lifelong complications of leads. It will decrease the risk for infection. Man, that is so awesome. Well, there you have it, everybody. Just break down some awesome tech. I want to pivot to myths versus facts that we do on each episode of Health360 with Dr. G. Uh, we're going to do this like this. Boom, 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 boom. We're going to try to get through as many of these as we can. Uh, I'm even going to participate. Mm-hmm. Now, now, Dr. Christian and I are going to try to do the best we can. We also may prognosticate a little bit, but here we go. So Miss versus facts, setting the record straight, cardiac tech. Here we go. This one's for you, my friend. First one's for you. Here's a statement. Across cardiac imaging, there will be greater use of 3D advanced visualization with limitless, limitless potential. Myth or fact, Dr. Christian? That's a total fact. <laughs> Please explain. Please so we are, we, are, we already have these technologies and they're becoming three-dimensional and even four-dimensional. Uh, the computing and processing power is what's limiting us. And once that happens, we, we we're, it's already heading in that direction. So that's already a fact and it's only going to keep yeah. getting better with our computing power. Excellent. Here's the next one. This is for you. Myth of fact, please explain. Simple, small wearable patient monitors have largely replaced traditional halter monitors. Myth of fact, please explain. That's a fact. We, for probably a decade now, we now have monitors that have no wires. And, you know, patients of mine that I used to give halters, you know, 20 years ago, when I tell them I'm going to put a monitor on it, it's like, the groans, like, oh, you got to wear this thing with all the wires. It's you know, like a, like I wear it like a, mm-hmm. like a backpack. These things are, have the, the, our ability to have power of computing and battery power. We can have a, a monitor that can monitor every heartbeat for 14 days that looks like the size of a large band aid. It has enough battery power and computing power to collect all that information. And that already exists. We use that in our practice right now. Wonderful. Here we go. This one's for Dr. G. Myth of fact, please explain for Dr. G. Here it is. Artificial intelligence, AI, will likely see its biggest steps forward in cardiology for point of care, triage apps, and wearables, cardiac monitoring technologies. I will call that a fact. Here's my here's my statement. It's a fact because this will speed the process of getting at-risk patients examined by a human cardiologist and aid in the early detection of cardiovascular diseases. Here's the next one, Dr. Christian. This is for you. Myth of fact, please, ex- please explain. We are at a point where physicians can reach out to patients for screenings to find early developing disease so they can be, be prevented and managed rather than the reactionary system used now to treat the result of end-stage disease. Myth of fact. It's, a, it's a fact. And I, I think our limitation is not technology now. It's our limitation is how do we communicate? How do we get that information to us in an actionable way that is efficient? All right, here we go. This one's for you. I'll come right back at you. Here it is. Myth of fact, please explain. We'll soon be seeing robots in the role of healthcare practitioners in both the catheterization and electrophysiology labs. Myth or fact, please explain. <laughs> Um, I think in the short term, it's going to be a myth. Uh, I think in, in the future there, it may, it may be a a fact, but the, I I think there's going to be certain tasks that, uh, computers and robots will be very mechanically well-suited to do. And at some point that'll happen. Uh, Hopefully it'll be after my career. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I like how you were you were you were also PC to your colleagues yeah. in individual cardiology, yeah. which helps me segue to the next statement. This is for Dr. G. We already answered it, but I'm going to say it again. Here it is. Uh, here it is. Image based virtual fractional flow reserve FFR assessments will replace diagnostic 
wire based angiograms. That is going to be, in my opinion, I think it's going to be a fact at some point. Yes. Uh, with advances in supercomputing, it is possible that images of the heart can be returned to the physician within minutes and with AI performing complex and complete analyses of disease cardiac segments. This could streamline the time to stint an artery and improve treatment outcomes. Here we go. Next one for you. I like this. Uh, Dr. Christian, here it is. Wearable or implantable technology will play a big role in better monitoring of heart failure patients to prevent hospitalizations and or readmissions. With fact, please explain. That's a fact. Some of that technology exists today, and it is, it's a disease process that's well suited to early intervention. So having the right sensors and having access to that information is going to tremendously benefit patients and, and our healthcare system. All right, here's the last one. We'll give this one to you. Here it is. As cybersecurity issues increase across healthcare and the and with the further digitalization of the industry and patient data, physicians may need to discuss with patients the cybersecurity risk of wireless connectivity of wearable and implantable devices. With in fact, please explain. It's a fact. We we live this every day in electrophysiology because these permanent pacemakers have remote home monitoring. And there have been some concerns, probably not quite fact on that part, but there, I, it's not impossible to think of a scenario where these devices in the future, as, as patients have access to interrogating them themselves, whether there could be cybersecurity issues. I, I think it's a fact that this will need to evolve and, and uh, we'll have to have safeguards in place to protect information. I appreciate you. So there you go. There it is, everybody. Myths versus facts. We have about five minutes left. This has been awesome conversation talking cardiac tech. So doc, at the beginning, we called it the chief complaint. In the end, we call it the assessment and plan. That's when we give people a diagnosis, a treatment plan, and most importantly, we schedule a follow-up. So doc, give us a few take-on points. People that have been listening to the show today, um, you know, ex being excited about what's out there, but what's kind of your message out there, you know, uh, for people that are interested in cardiac tech, maybe how to use it, or maybe how to talk to their doc, what, what should somebody take away from today's uh, discussion? Well, I think the, you know, real take home for a patient is, currently is that don't be afraid of the technology. The technology <laughs> has great potential. Learn about it and see how you can utilize it for you or a loved one. Uh, it may not even be for you. You may be for your parent or for your siblings that uh, the technology that we have now, as you learn about it, you'll recognize that it might have uh, real ramifications for helping you with preventing disease, keeping you out of the hospital. And that's for someone who doesn't already have those diseases. Now, for people that do have diseases, talking to your, to your physicians, uh, there's a wealth of data and technology that we can use to help you stay out of the hospital, to help you catch disease early if you uh, get the right screening test. So I think there's technology that's out there for someone who wants to take it one step further and not just monitor their own health at home, but to get some more advanced uh, information about their health status through some of these more advanced technologies. All right. Well, thank you, Doc. And so before we get to my final thoughts, we do a section here on Health360 with Dr. G called the Listener Healthy Oh Yeah Content. This is when we get to give a shout out to a loyal listener. And here's the question that I pose on the social. So the question was this, what kinds of activities do you do to restore yourself both physically and mentally? And here's a quote from loyal listener MWB. Here it is, quote, reading, fishing, and working in the yard. Well, thank you, MWB. We appreciate you sharing your story. And I always hear, I always enjoy hearing about your journey. Remember that this, your story may be a catalyst for someone else who needs to hear it. So my final thoughts are this. Heart tech is driving a paradigm shift in how we care for cardiac or even pre-cardiac patients. Within the next couple of years, cardiology might be more about prediction and early intervention than about the treatment of full-blown diseases. Digital health technologies continue to join forces with traditional preventive tools in cardiology to combat heart attack, heart failure, valvular heart disease, arrhythmias, and other cardiovascular disorders and risks. New advances in heart tech show immense promise, not just for what's being used right now in many healthcare centers across this country, but for what lies ahead in the years to come. 
So I want to thank my guest today, Dr. Kosha Krishnan. Doc, thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you. I had a blast. Thank you very much for the invitation. Hey, it's been my pleasure. Hey, everybody. You've been listening to and watching Health 360 with Dr. G, a healthy German podcast. This episode is written by Mark D. Gomez, MD, and Tiffany E.R. Gomez. The producers are Tiffany E.R. Gomez and Sarah Zwack. Audio and video production specialist is Mike Paskey. Copyright 2023, Edward Elmer's Health, all rights reserved. For more awesome health information, visit me at health360podcast.com and follow me across all the socials at health 360 G. This is Dr. G signing off. And until next time, peace. Out.